In this high yield topic video, we are going to learn about amylotropic lateral sclerosis. Okay, so what happens or what is amylotropic lateral sclerosis? It's basically a progressive neurodegenerative disease and this progressive neurodegenerative disease only affect motor neurons and it affects motor neuron both in the brain as well as in the spinal cord. Let's look in detail about the pathogenesis or pathophysiology of this. So, there will be accumulation of misfolded protein. Now, this misfolded protein will predispose the neurons to damage. And there are two mechanisms by which the neuronal damage will happen. Number one being oxidative stress. So, there is an increased, you know, uh, pre preponsity of damage by oxidative stress in these neurons. And the second is glutamate toxicity. And when we are going to learn the treatment, we will see the drugs which will act on these specific mechanisms. So, there is an accumulation of misfolded protein which will predispose the neuron to damage and the neuronal damage will happen in the anterior horn of spinal cord as well as in the motor cortex. So, interestingly, and this is the probably the most important point which you have to learn and know about this topic is you will have both upper motor neuron lesion features as well as lower motor neuron features. So, when we are going to discuss the clinical, you know, signs and symptoms, we'll see that in amylotropic lateral sclerosis, you will have features of both upper motor neuron lesion as well as lower motor neuron lesion. Having said that, one more important point here is that these accumulation of misfolded protein are seen as bunina bodies in the cytoplasm of the neurons, okay? And these are ubiquitin positive aggregates having TDP43. So, again, this is a question which has been asked. So, bunina bodies are seen in amylotropic lateral sclerosis. Let's look at the genetics. So, 90% of the cases are sporadic, whereas only 10% of the cases are familial. And when they are familial, they are transmitted as autosomal dominant trait. There are two specific familial cases which you have to know. One when there is a mutation of SOD1 gene, that is superoxide dimutase 1 gene. So, again, it will be inherited as an autosomal dominant trait. Almost 20% of the familial cases are due to the mutation of SOD1 gene. And when SOD1 gene mutation is there, it is also called as ALS type 1. Okay, so they will ask you what is the mutation seen in ALS type 1. The next is when there is a mutation of C9 ORF72 gene. So, what is this C9 ORF72 gene? C9 is chromosome 9, ORF is open reading frame 72 gene. So, this again is transmitted as an autosomal dominant uh, trait, but there are two, three very important points about this particular subtype which you have to remember. Number one, there is hexanucleotide repeats in this particular subtype, which means a pair of, I mean, six nucleotides will keep on repeating uh, in this particular condition. The second is, there is frontotemporal dementia seen in these cases. Now, interestingly, if you see, this is a primarily motor disease which spares consciousness, okay? So, but in this particular subtype, you will have features of 
fronto temporal differentia and this is what separates this particular subtype as compared to any other you know amyotrophic lateral sclerosis let's quickly look at the clinical features now the early symptoms can be there is a progressive weakness of the distal muscles so progressive distal muscle weakness now remember this weakness is asymmetric okay and how will it manifest so you know distal muscles are getting weak so the patient may you know complain that he is not able to hold cup properly you know if he holds cup accidentally it falls down he may not be able to open the door knob again proximal uh, distal muscle weakness or he may not be able to you know turn on the ignition of the car he may find it very very difficult so there will be signs of progressive distal muscle weakness you know complaints of progressive distal muscle weakness. eventually you know remember in later stages there will be complete muscle you know paralysis and so this will move to symmetric so in the exam if they give you ask you what is uh, you know the type of muscle weakness which we see is it symmetric or asymmetric remember it is asymmetric initially but eventually it will become symmetric so these are the earlier symptoms also you know as the disease progress you will start having the upper motor as well as the lower motor neural region so there will be increased weakness of the muscles which will eventually start having the patient may start having bulbar or pseudo bulbar palsy which means he will have dysarthria that is difficulty in speaking and dysphagia difficulty in eating okay and as i have told you if it is because of lower motor neuron lesion it will be bulbar palsy or if it is due to upper motor neuron lesion it will be due to uh, it will be pseudo bulbar palsy and there is a lecture which i have created completely on difference between bulbar and pseudo bulbar palsy that you can refer to for the details but remember there can be dysarthria and dysphagia either because of bulbar palsy or uh, pseudo bulbar palsy depending upon where the lesion is there also ultimately there will be respiratory weakness and most of this patient die because of respiratory failure and all these you know you will have to understand that you will have to give a lot of supportive care for dysphagia and respiratory weakness also if you see i have told you that it will have upper motor neuron lesion features as well as lower motor neuron lesion features so what are the upper uh, lower motor neuron features so he may have spasticity brisk reflexes clonus and features of pseudo bulbar palsy so one interesting feature of pseudo bulbar palsy is the emotional you know lability in this patient so the patient may start crying without any reason or he may start laughing without any reason okay so that is the features of upper motor neuron lesion lower motor neuron and if you understand correctly that depending upon which part of the brain or the spinal cord is affected you will have either upper motor neuron lesion and lower motor neuron lesion features if you talk about lower motor neuron lesion so there will be atrophy of muscles there will be fasciculations there will be muscular weakness and there may be also features of bulbar palsy again there is a complete video lecture on differences between upper motor neuron lesion and lower motor neuron lesion for the complete set of differences you can refer to that lecture now here is something very important which i am going to do in if there is only upper motor neuron lesion features we call this as primary lateral sclerosis okay if there is no lower motor neuron lesion features only upper motor neuron lesion features in a patient we call it as primary lateral sclerosis if there is only lower motor neuron lesion we call it as primary muscular atrophy and only only when you have both upper motor 
neuron lesion features as well as lower motor neuron features, then we call it as amylotropic lateral sclerosis. Okay. And if you want to remember the clinical features of this particular condition, you can think of this famous personality, Stephen Hawking. So he was completely paralyzed. You could not speak. You could not eat. But, you know, uh, he was able to read. He was able to think. So consciousness was not impaired. Especially, uh, only, especially, you know, uh, in that subtype where there is a fronto dementia, uh, frontotemporal dementia. Apart from that, the consciousness is maintained. So one very, very important thing is what is spared in this condition. So remember, ocular motility is spared in this condition. And how do we know that? If you remember, Stephen Hawking can, could have read, you know, even till the end of his life. The second is bladder and bowel control is spared. So the patient will not have, uh, you know, will be able to control the bladder and bowel movement. And last, except in the sub uh, subtype where there is a frontotemporal dementia, consciousness is preserved. Okay. So these are the three things which are spared. So this brings us to the complete set of uh, clinical features of uh, amylotropic lateral sclerosis. Let's quickly look at how do we diagnose it. So it's basically clinical, okay, and it is also you know diagnosis of exclusion, okay. So we know that this particular condition affects the Bulbar region, the cervical region, the thoracic region, and the lumbosacral region. Okay, so if out of these three or four regions are affected, we call it as a definitive case of ALS. And if only one or two, you know, uh, of these are affected, we call it as probable case of ALS. Okay, we can also do a electromyography or a neuronal studies, electromyography. One very important thing is that we see that in this case, you have features of both upper motor neuron lesion as well as lower motor neuron lesion. So you will have to think of all the conditions where there is both a combination of upper motor neuron lesion as well as lower motor neuron lesion. So let's list out the most important conditions where there is a mix of both upper motor neuron lesion as well as lower motor neuron lesion. The first important condition is subacute combined degeneration because of B12 deficiency. So in this also, there will be a mix of upper motor neuron lesion features as well as lower motor neuron lesion features. The next important condition is ALS. The third condition is advanced multiple sclerosis. Now, fourth set of conditions are where there is a you know compression or a damage to spine on a particular level. So conditions like transverse myelitis, conditions like you know, there is a damage to spinal cord at a particular level okay or conditions like syringomyelia so all these conditions there will be a mix of both upper motor neuron lesion as well as lower motor neuron lesion and in this particular subset of cases okay remember that you know above the lesion level there will be features of lower motor neuron lesion and Below the level of the lesion, you will have features of upper motor neuron lesion features. Okay, so these are important diagnostic criteria. One last thing is there are certain important biomarkers which have come. Now, biomarkers are biological, you know, uh, tests which helps us to identify these diseases much earlier. So there are three biomarkers which I will talk about. Number one is chemo attractant protein. So, number one is a chemoattractant protein, specifically monocyte chemoattractant protein. Number two is neurofilament. 
heavy chain and number 3 is neuro filament light chain so these three are important biomarkers monocyte chemotractin protein neurofilament heavy chain and neurofilament light chain and these help us to and these are seen in csf okay these are csf biomarkers and which help us to diagnose als much earlier moving to the treatment okay so the first drug is riluzole and the mechanism by which, by which riluzole acts is basically reducing the glutamate toxicity remember we talked that there are two mechanisms by which there will be increased neuronal damage one of them was glutamate toxicity so riluzole works on that particular mechanism the second is Ideravone. Now, Ideravone decreases the oxidative stress or damage due to oxidative stress in neurons. The third is phenyl butyrate. Again, we have seen the mechanism of action that it, it reduces the glutamate levels. Okay. And the most important part of these patients are supportive therapy because most of these patients will have complete motor paralysis. So, you will have to give physical therapy for mobility you will have to give speech therapy you will also have to support the respiratory effort by the by either non invasive ventilation or in some case, in many cases tracheostomy and you will have to take care of nutrition because most of these patients you know will have difficulty in eating either through feeding tube or through a jejunostomy, gastrojejunostomy. So, these are the supportive measures. What is the prognosis? Now, prognosis is not good. So, the median survival of these patients are just 3 to 5 years after onset of disease. Okay, after onset of disease, the median survival is 3 to 5 years. Now, this completes our discussion on uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So, let me quickly take you through what are the important questions which they will ask you from this top particular topic. So, they have asked about these two drugs. Okay, they have asked about the biomarkers, chemotractin protein monocyte, uh, monocyte protein. You have to know about the differential diagnosis, all the differential diagnosis of the uh, conditions where there is both a mix of upper motor neuron lesion features as well as lower motor neuron lesion features and they have asked about you know uh, they have asked about whether the muscle weakness is asymmetric or symmetric and you know distal muscles are more involved initially or proximal muscles so this is one point they have asked then they have also asked about this uh, C9ORF72 gene with hexanucleotide repeats and frontotemporal dementia they have asked about ALS type 1 what is the mutation in ALS type 1 they have asked about this Bunena bodies so these are the you know top uh, questions which are, they have asked from this particular topic